Our Gospel reading this morning comes from Mark chapter 6, verse 30 to 34. The apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all that they had done and what they had taught. Then Jesus said, Let's get away from the crowds for a while and rest. There were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. They left by boat for a quieter spot, but many people saw them leaving, and people from many times ran ahead along the shore and met them as they landed. A vast crowd was there as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he taught them many things. This is the bread of our Lord. I think one of the most important explanations for the ministry of Jesus is hidden in that little passage that Lorraine just read to us. We all know the very famous reasons that Jesus gave for coming, such as John 10.10, 10, I have come that you might have life, life in all its fullness, or how did the King James put it? Abundant life. So we know that verse, that's a very famous verse. We also know Matthew 20.28, 20, which says, uh, Jesus says, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Those are very familiar ideas. Uh, they tell us the results of Jesus' ministry, namely that we can have an abundant life and the lost can be saved. Very important ideas. But we might ask, what motivated Jesus? What was, it, what was in his heart? And maybe that should be what's in our heart. What should motivate our lives in his service? A heart, I think, of compassion. And I think we can imitate that. But let's take a step back and uh, talk about a little introduction to this passage. A few days before the events of this passage took place, Jesus had sent his 12 disciples and he'd given them the name apostles, which means missionaries or sent ones. And he'd sent them out to preach, to teach, to heal and to drive out evil spirits. We know that from earlier in Mark 6. And I looked at this a couple of weeks ago. You probably remember that slide. And uh, they were to travel light and they were to go to the local towns two by two. And we asked the question, who went with who? Our passage now picks up their return in verse 30. But we have to ask, what happened in the meantime? Well, while the disciples were away, Jesus gets some very sad and disturbing news. Governor Herod, that's Herod Antipas, who is nasty King Herod from Jesus' birth's son, who is the governor of Galilee, and supposedly being a shepherd for the people of Israel, it says in verse 21 that he gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and leading people of Galilee. At this banquet, for his cronies and supporters, Herod is manipulated by his wife Herodias and by his stepdaughter Salome to have John the Baptist's head on a plate. If you remember that story, it's earlier in chapter 6. And so our first point, the first point that I want to make is that Jesus really does care for his disciples verses 30 to 32, because they need some rest and recuperation. And for two reasons that is given. First reason is that um, when devastating news comes, we sometimes need to take some R&R. &R. So while the twelve were away, we are told in Matthew's account that some of John the Baptist's disciples approach Jesus and tell him of John's death. Knowing that John and Jesus were cousins and that some of his own apostles had previously been John the Baptist's disciples led Jesus to take the actions that he chose. When the disciples return, 
Jesus decides to withdraw across the lake to a solitary place to be alone. He wants to give them the devastating news in an appropriately quiet setting. R&R, &R, I think, is needed when we get some devastating news. We need to have a, a moment away for some rest and recuperation. But there is also another reason given here in the text. We need rest and recuperation when our own well-being is at risk. So after the disciples return from their missionary journey, they don't even have a time to spend any quality with Jesus. It's early morning and as they gather, so does the crowd, making it hard to have any time with Jesus. In fact, verse 31 tells us that they didn't even get time to eat, so no breakfast for them. The crowd was so overwhelming that they didn't even have time for rest or breakfast. You see, sometimes ministry is like that. It has highs and lows, both of which can take their toll on us. As the disciples returned from their mission trip, Jesus was probably wanting to talk to them. Probably knew that they were a bit tired from their travels and eager to catch up with him. And so he suggests some R&R &R across the lake. So R&R &R is needed for our well-being when it's at risk. Ministry and service can be demanding and it can be very stressful. It can take a big toll on us and so can life. Life can be draining and painful, especially if a loved one dies. So Jesus' principle here of R&R, &R, rest and recuperation, is really important for us to observe even today. Don't you agree? Rest and recuperation, sleep and other things are really important. Remember the story of Jesus being asleep in the back of the boat in the middle of a terrible storm? So I'm glad that last Sunday we had a little bit of our R&R, &R, Lynn and I. We were able to do a fair bit of gardening and um, John was able to step up. We were supposed to, of course, be in Sydney visiting our family, but that wasn't possible. And so the Sabbath principle is a good one. Now what will happen if we don't get some R&R? &R? We'll burn out. That's the possibility. Or we'll get angry. Or we'll get abusive for people who frustrate or annoy us. We'll get forgetful. Sleep and rest are vital for our well-being. So off they sail across the lake. Now if the breeze was with them, it may have taken you know, maybe an hour or so to get across the lake. If the breeze wasn't with them, maybe two, because they had to row. And during that trip, I think they began their R&R &R with Jesus. They could catch up with him, tell him their mission news, and grab a little bite to eat while they were crossing the lake. And he also had time, I think, during that to tell them of John's death. And so in a sense, their needed R&R &R was beginning to happen in the boat when they were with, the, with Jesus. And so that leads to the second part of this passage, verses 33 and 34. Jesus responds now, not to the disciples' needs, but to the crowd's needs. And there are three principles for us here. As Jesus is in his disciples sail across the lake, the crowd notice where they're going and decide to follow them. The crowd, it says, were, were walking swiftly around the shore and uh, it took a couple of hours, but they got there ahead of where the boat was going to land. Now, imagine that you're in the boat. You're in the boat with Jesus and you're having a good time, you're getting a bit of breakfast and uh, maybe you're having some R&R &R with him and all of a sudden... You want to be in a solitary, quiet place, what happens? You get to, the, get to the shore and there are thousands of people descend upon you. How would you feel? Well, for me, I think I probably would be frustrated. I would say to Jesus, let's get back in the boat and go the other side. But we learn some really important lessons here from Jesus. And I think there are three of them in verse 34. The three verbs that are used in verse 34. One, 
to see as Jesus sees, verse 34a. As Jesus walks up the beach, the people crowd towards him. What does he see? He sees the actual people. Old, young, tall, short, men, women, children, and so on. Now there's a saying, isn't there? It's easy to get lost in a crowd. When there are lots of people, lots of faces, they all can blur in together. And uh, if we're there, it can happen for us too. But not so for Jesus. He saw the crowd, but he didn't just see the crowd. He saw you and me within the crowd. People who need his guidance and help. Let me tell you another story about Jesus that shows his heart as well. It's in Luke chapter 7, verse 12. It says, A funeral procession was coming out as Jesus approached the village. A young man had died and was a widow's son an only son, and a large crowd from the village was with them, mourning. When the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. Don't cry, he said. Then he walked over to the coffin and touched it, and the bearers stopped. Young man, he said, I tell you, get up. And the dead boy sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. But I like the verse, verse 12, that says, When Jesus saw her, his heart was overflowing with compassion. Isn't that a beautiful image? And that's the challenge for us today. Don't look past people. Don't look through them. Look beyond the immediate. I mean, I should say, don't look beyond the immediate to the frustration, but see people's real needs. It's not easy. It sometimes is frustrating. It can be costly. It did cost Jesus a lot in terms of his exhaustion. But it is very much like him to do that. So firstly, then, see people as Jesus sees them. But secondly, we need to care for people as Jesus cared for them in verse 34b. When Jesus saw the people, his heart went out to them. The word used here in the Greek is... Well, let me try and pronounce it for you. Splatch chinodzomai. Splat chinodzomai. I used to do Greek when I was at college, and this is a really long one. But do you know what it means? It means your intestines were all churned up. That's what it means. It's a very graphic Greek word. Jesus was so moved that his whole. Have you ever had your heart beat for people? Have you ever had your intestines be churned up because of what you saw? That's what this word means. It's a very graphic word. The English word compassion is about the closest we can get to it. Jesus was moved and his heart ached for these people. It was more than just pity. It was deep compassion, an overwhelming heart compassion. There's a story about William Booth who started the Salvation Army. Before he started it, he was a Methodist lay preacher and evangelist. And he was regularly frustrated by the lack of impact within his congregation. After a fairly difficult day, Booth couldn't sleep, so he decided to take a walk. He walked down the poor side of London's east, and there in the cover of darkness, he saw dozens of homeless impoverished, destitute and abused urchins, is what he called them, young and old. It began to rain heavily and Booth's heart was powerfully moved by compassion by the sight of these derelict people living half-lives, really. Next morning Booth said to his wife, I've been to hell. But out of that, out of that nightmarish experience came the vision for the Salvation Army. Had Booth not ventured out that night, leaving the security of his own home, he might never have seen the great needs of the homeless. So moved was he by compassion, like the compassion of Jesus, was that his dream went out from a self-sacrificing mission for the rest of his life, 
and millions of lives have been transformed by the care of the Salvation Army. Today they operate with deep compassion in almost every country in the world. And if you ask the average Aussie which, which Christian group they think need their respect and support, who would they say? The Salvos. They put their money where their mouth is. Well, so do the Gideons and, and uh, hopefully the United Church and the Baptists and others do that. But uh, the Salvos have a good reputation in the Australian community for that very reason. They care deeply with compassion. And they act as Jesus would act. That's the third point. Verse 34c. Filled with compassion, Jesus steps out decisively. He steps up into the midst of the crowd because he sees them in great need as harassed and helpless and leaderless like sheep without a shepherd. And that's a very common Old Testament theme to describe the people's plight when their leaders had let them down. How they were leaders were selfish like Herod had been, had abandoned them, hadn't cared for them. And of course Herod was doing a lousy job of being a shepherd. The last word to describe him would have been compassion for the people. Um, but that's used many times of Jesus. And Jesus himself uses it to describe the motives of the good Samaritan in Luke 10 and the father who runs to his son in Luke 15, the prodigal son. That word is used in both of those occasions by Jesus. And compassion leads to kind action. No wonder in connection with this event in John's Gospel we read that Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That is true compassion, to give of oneself. Final little story to finish. Young Amy was in primary school and she was going to her very first track and field morning and it went well for her. Her mother watched as she won four ribbons, including a blue one, for first place. Later in the day, when she came home from school, the blue ribbon was missing. Her mum asked her what happened to it. Oh, said Amy, Bruce was crying because he didn't get a ribbon, so I gave it to him. Her mother hugged her and said, that was a lovely and generous thing to do. Why not, said Amy, I know I want it. <laughs> All of us, actually, even us adults, need a little bit more of Amy's compassion and generosity in our lives, don't we? I think the world would be a much better place. And if there's one motivation that should be in our hearts, and in the hearts of Jesus' family, is his, for, his, is, for us, is his compassion for others. Jesus moved in compassion, saw the people as lost, and he began to teach them many things. He shared the gospel with them of the good news of the kingdom. And of course, Matthew and Luke add that he healed many of their sick. And as the day unfolds, Jesus feeds 5,000 of them. But that's another story. Summary. What does this passage encourage us to do? Well, I think we have a glimpse into the very heart of Jesus and it should leave us with two reminders and two challenges. Firstly, the need for R&R, &R, rest and recuperation. In times of sadness or when our health is about to suffer, we need to take time out for self to reconnect with Jesus, to be renewed, and hopefully coming to church each week is a little bit like that. A bit of R&R, &R, a bit of singing and fellowship and having God's word pierce your heart. So in a small way, I think you can be empowered to come to church, but you might need R&R &R in a different way. Don't forget to sleep. Secondly, the power of compassion. Remember that Jesus sees you as you really are. He sees who you are, as John was reminding us in his prayer. And he is the good shepherd who loves you. Memorise Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not 
Beautiful psalm to memorize. God loves you with deep compassion. And our Lord invites us to cultivate that same type of compassion towards those who are around us. Paul says to his friends in Colossae, he says, As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion. I like that. Put on compassion as a garment so that it's all around you. Pray for it. Be open to the Holy Spirit's prompting and live out the compassion of Jesus.